Hey, good evening, RPYA. Nice to be here with you. My name is Tim. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here. I work primarily with the, the high school ministry. I get to be here most Sunday nights, hanging out with you guys too. Uh, and so I, I'm excited. We're going to jump into our passage in just a moment. I do want to highlight if there's anyone who's having trouble finding a seat, there's room right here in the front. It's always fun when you get up to teach and like right here is like, but it's fine. Jesus is there. It's great. Um, I'm going to pray for us and we're going to jump in. Sound good? Cool. Thanks, guys. Uh, Jesus, we, God, we, we come here on a Sunday night uh, on the turning point. We've had a week. We're getting ready to go into a week. Jesus, God, I just pray, Lord, that, that the things of this past week, God, that would, they would just melt away into you as we come and spend time in your word. God, that the uh, concerns, the anxieties, or even the excitement for this next week, God, that that would just be on pause for just a moment, that we'd be able to meet with you as your people connecting with you through your word. God, would you meet us by your spirit as we jump in tonight to what you would have for us? God, Lord, would you illuminate it to us? God, would we find things that are, that are practical and meaningful for, for our daily life, our walk with you? God, would you give us life as we spend time, God, with your words. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are in this series right now called Living and Active, where we're looking at uh, the, the reality of God's word and its role that it plays in our life uh, and how we can turn, no matter where it is in the Bible, we can find things that God has for us that matter today. That it's not just stuff that's old and dusty. It's not just uh, things that are for people long gone in the past. That there are things that are that are happening in God's word for us right now when we connect with it. Uh, in Hebrews 4, we've already looked at in this series, it talks about for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God's word is powerful and it impacts us in our lives. 2 Timothy 3, it says, all scripture is God breathe. That when we come to God's word, it's like it's coming from, from the inside of who he is out to us. Like the same way that your breath comes from inside of your lungs out into the air. That scripture is coming from who God is out to us. Uh, and so we're, we've been in a bunch of different passages, kind of like Kate was saying at the beginning of worship. Uh, some of them are a little uh, more obscure than other ones. Uh, and really, it's just a chance for different people to come in and talk about, hey, there, here are things in the Bible that have mattered to me that I think maybe will matter to you too. And so maybe you're early in your journey of exploring who Jesus is and exploring God's word, and this is just a chance to see some of what's in there. Or maybe you've been coming for a long time, and it's great to be reminded of the fact that, that some of those passages that we've skimmed over, that, that God wants us to meet, or wants to meet us there, some of the passages that we're incredibly familiar with, that we could uh, recite almost verbatim or that we hear it and we almost tune out because of how many times we've heard it, that in there too, God has things for us today, not just when we were five and had to memorize it the first time or seven and learn the song for it or in middle school or whatever it was, that God wants to meet us now today in his word, that anytime we open up the Bible, it's a chance to meet with the God of the universe. But the truth is that some passages are easier to get something out of than others. Um, my wife and I, my wife is actually in the room in the back. Hi, Silvana. Um, I know. She's hot. I'm lucky. Um, she, she and I, we love watching uh, cooking shows together. Uh, especially, uh, there's a show that's been on for, I think it's been on for a long time now, uh, called Master Chef, where uh, Gordon Ramsay and a rotating cast of judges have these home cooks that are incredibly more talented than I could ever be come in and they all cook for the show. And one of the, one of the classic challenges, right, is classic reality show. Someone always gets eliminated at the end after they've made some crazy blunder or whatever. Or they've lost a challenge or someone, whatever. Uh, one of the classic challenges is they're given uh, a crab to cook and they need to get as much meat out of the crab as possible. And so they'll have the home chefs do it, and they get, they get way more meat out of it than I would be able to. Uh, and then one of the, the chefs on the panel will come and do it, and they're, just, they're getting meat out of, like, the claw and the leg and every tiny little piece. Uh, and they, they'll lay it out sometimes even in the shape of a crab. And now I'm talking about MasterChef way more than I really intended to. But 
Uh, the point is that, that a lot of times in that crab, there's way more hiding than, than I would ever notice as someone who's an amateur when it comes to food. I just like eating food. I'm not very good at preparing it. Uh, I definitely couldn't like tell you everything about a crab. Uh, there are parts of the Bible, there are some parts of the Bible where it's really easy to find the meat. Right? You open up to the book of Ephesians and you're reading through it and it's talking about the ways that we've been blessed in Christ and our new identity in him and how God wants us to live. And you're like, man, I can meet God here. And then we open up to other parts of the Bible and it's like, hey, here's a, a list of rules for people who are living, walking with God in the desert 4,000-ish years ago. And you're like, not sure what, what's here for me. Uh, there are times when we open up to things. It's like, man, this is Jesus doing the Sermon on the Mount. Like, this is so, man, I could see putting this into practice in my life. And there are other times we're reading the story of some king in the Bible we've never heard of who has a name that's hard to pronounce, who does or doesn't follow God, and we kind of shrug. And so today, uh, I, I want to come to a, a passage that for me originally was one of those passages that when I first read it, I was like, this is weird, and I just moved past it. I, I like Every time I would come to this, I'd be like, I don't know if I fully understand why this is here, but I trust God that it means something, and I would just keep going. Uh, but there was a point in my life where this, it, a, a switch flipped, where something changed, because I, just, I sat down with this passage for a little bit longer to study it. There was a, a point, as, as the high school pastor, uh, I get a lot of enjoyment out of spending time on social media and just looking for some of the popular objections to Christianity. Because sometimes the popular objections are things that have uh, been around for a long time and have been debunked, or the things that like sound really good in a you know, 30 second, one minute TikTok video. Uh, but if you really like scratch into the surface, there's not a whole lot there, but constantly, you know, high school students are constantly going, you know, they're coming through the door all the time and they're like, oh, I saw this thing and I'm really worried about this. And so they want to talk about it. And so I was digging into one of those objections where you'll hear every once in a while, like, hey, there's no way I could follow the God of the Bible because the God of the Bible Want, like, he calls for child sacrifice. And I was like, that doesn't sound like the God that I know. But I went and opened up that passage. I was like, oh, this is this story that every time I get to, I'm like, oh, I don't really understand it. And I keep and I keep going past it. And so today I want to talk about Judges chapter 11. If you have your Bible, you can open up there to Judges chapter 11. Uh, because as I dug into this passage, and as I got to know it a little bit more, it went from something that was rather obscure or was a little bit confusing to me and instead became a, a strong reminder of my life, or in my life, of the importance of understanding who God is and knowing his character and the outcome that can or can't have in our life. That there are going to be times where, depending on who we know God to be, if we get that wrong, we could be diligent in thinking we're following him and doing what he wants and be making tragic mistakes in our life. And so we're going to open up to Judges chapter 11. We're going to be, re be reading most of this story together. Um, there's one section in the middle that we're just going to skip right past. I'll explain why when we get there. Uh, Judges chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Jephthah, that's, that's how you say that. At least that's how I'm going to say it. Jephthah, the Gileite, was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. So he's like ranked because he's the son of the man who's a mighty warrior who has a whole clan of people named after him, but he's also the son of that guy's like side chick. Uh, he's like least ranked in a high ranked family, right? So he's a guy there. His dad's a mighty warrior, but he's the outsider in his family. Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You're not going to get any inheritance from our family, they said, because you're the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. He becomes sort of like this Old Testament version of like Robin Hood, cast out, gang, a gang of scoundrels comes around him and they're going around doing scoundrel things. Sometime later, when the Amorites were fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Amorites. They're like, hey, remember how we kicked you out of the family? Remember how we sent you away? Well, it turns out there's this really scary group of people. Our enemies are coming. 
we need you to come be our commander. I know we kicked you out, but actually we need you to come back and be in charge. Can you help fix this problem for us? All right, here comes his family asking him for help because he's established a reputation for himself as this leader of this group. Uh, verse 7, Jephthah said to them, didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to him, Nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us to fight the Am Ammonites, and you will be head over all, all of us who live in Gilead. Jephthah answered him, Suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord Yahweh gives them to me. Will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, Yahweh as our witness. We will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them. And he repeated all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king with the question, What do you have against me that you've attacked my country? The king of the Ammonites answered Jephthah's message. When Israel came up out of Egypt, they took away my land from Arnon of, to the Jabbok all the way to the Jordan. Now give it back peacefully. Jephthah sent back a messenger, or sent back messages to the Ammonite king. And so he sends this message back. Spoilers, the king is not going to listen to it. Because the king doesn't listen to it, we're going to skip over that message. If you want to read it back later, for context, go for it. There's nothing that really changes the story other than Jephthah kind of gives some history of, hey, here is some of the movement that's happened in the land. Here, the truth is that our God has given us this land. We're not going to give it back to you. And so we're going to skip down to verse 27. I've not wronged you, but you're doing me wrong by waging war against me. This is the end of Jephthah's message. Let Yahweh, let the Lord, the judge, decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. The king of Ammon, however, paid no attention to the message Jephthah sent him. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead, and Manasseh passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And so verse 29 is this marker in the book of Judges that comes up constantly in the book through different stories that are there for when God sends his presence, his Holy Spirit, to, to direct a judge, a warrior leader, to do battle for the sake of his people. And you, you see it throughout the book in different spots that when God has decided to move in victory, he sends his spirit for a time to be on the person he's going to use as the leader in that case. And so God does that in verse 29. Then in verse 30, And Jephthah made a vow, a promise of the Lord, if you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites, will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. And so here is that weird passage. Here's why it gets disputed. Here's why people will point to it and be like, here's the Bible saying human sacrifice is good. Right? Jephthah makes a vow to God, hey, when I return, if you give me victory, I will burn as a sacrifice whatever or whoever comes out of my house. Now the the reality is he probably wasn't thinking the house cat was going to be the first to, to greet him. It probably wasn't going to be the goat or the cow or the normal kinds of sacrifices that Israelites were, were going to make. He probably was expecting a person, maybe a servant, maybe a member of the house, uh, like his, his family who had rejected him to come out. Maybe he's even thinking, man, I'll kill two birds with one stone. I'll get God's favor by making this promise and maybe take out one of my family members who I, like he still is, doesn't seem super happy with his family, even though they've made him the leader. And so maybe that's what he's thinking. We don't exactly know what's going through his mind, but he makes this promise to God. If you give me victory, I'll sacrifice whatever comes out of my house. Verse 32, then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from Aor to the vicinity of Mineth as far as Abel, Kirim. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. So here's this tragedy. His plan has backfired. Whatever he had planned, there's no way 
in his mind, his daughter was on the table. And so whether he was thinking family member or random person, and there's no way he was thinking, right, instead that it would be his only child. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh, no, my daughter. You have brought me down, and I'm devastated. I've made a vow to Yahweh, to the Lord, that I cannot break. Dad, she replied, you've given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised. Now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request. Give me two months to roam the hills and to weep with my friends, because I'll never marry. You can go, he said. And he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept, because she would never marry. And after two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed. She was a virgin. And from this comes the Israelite tradition, that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileite. And so she ends up being sacrificed. Now, there, there are some commentaries, there are some biblical scholars who are like, you know, maybe the word that's used here, it could mean that she went to go serve in like the, the temple, the tabernacle area, and maybe she just gave, she gave her life to God, that was her sacrifice, and so she just never got married, and so that, but I don't think that's the story that the, the passage is telling us, and I don't think that's the plain reading of what's actually there. I think the story that we're reading here is that Jephthah makes a promise to God, I will make a burnt sacrifice to you. His daughter comes out, he's devastated, she's devastated, and then she's sacrificed. And so this begs a really obvious question, a question that comes out so often as a, uh, as a ch- excuse me, as a challenge to Christianity. Uh, so does this story mean that God approves of human sacrifice? Jephthah has the Spirit of the Lord come on him. He makes a promise that's bound to end in human sacrifice. And yet God seems to honor that vow and provides him victory. And so to answer that, we're going to turn to context for our, for our understanding. Context is incredibly important when we come to God's word. Uh, context is huge in our lives. Uh, and to, to illustrate that, I want to give a little example from my life. The other day, uh, I got some, some, some texts from a, a young lady. Um, actually, I'm going to throw up one of the first texts, the, the smallest picture up here. It said, good night, with a lot, of, a lot of heart emojis, a lot of things from this. This was not my wife, uh, who I also would describe as a young lady. Um, she said, and I, you know, how would you feel getting, like, but you know what, I, I even responded, good night, uh, what, maybe I shouldn't be talking about this with my wife here, right. fullest context, last picture, it was my daughter, Liliana, um, she was texting daddy good night, uh, because I was out at some work thing while she was going to bed, uh, context makes a huge deal, Have you ever sent texts to someone that if I just took one of those texts and put it up on the screen, I was like, uh, so-and-so sent this text, would you be like, why are you showing that to people? That needs more context and more explaining. Uh, Context is a big deal. Context changes these things. You guys can take that down. Um, Like, uh, sending goodnight texts to my eight-year-old would be very different than if I was texting one of my high school students, those same exact things, right? Like, that would be really weird. Uh, it's a, a really different thing if I'm, you know, depending on who it is that we're in relationship with. And so context, even when we come to the Bible, is really important. God's word is living and active. It's powerful in our life. But we need to understand it as, as the truth that it's trying to communicate. We can't just take God's word out of context. The power isn't in the order of the words. It's not like magic words. The power is in the truth that God is communicating to us through his word. The power is in what he's trying to convey to us, what he's trying to help us to understand. And so we want to get to the core of what's going on. And as we dig into the core of this story, I think we're going to see something that's maybe more surprising and more relevant to us than we would think uh, about this battle that happened in an obscure part of the Middle East thousands and thousands of years ago. And so let's go to some context. The first place we'll go to context is in the chapter itself. So in this chapter, 
God sends his spirit as a sign of victory in verse 29 before Jephthah makes his promise. Before Jephthah makes a vow to God, God has already shown us in the story through the author and the order of events as they're happening that he already plans to offer victory. Victory doesn't come as a consequence of the promise or the sacrifice. Victory comes because God has sent his spirit in advance. God is planning to protect his people, whether that promise happens or not. So the author is marking for us that God has already made his decision before Jephthah takes his vow. Next, we zoom out a little bit more and talk about the book, right? So we look in the chapter and we can see kind of in the order that Jephthah's promise comes not after God offers victory, but or not before God offers victory, but after God offers victory. But in the book, in the book of Judges, we see that Judges is full of broken people being used by God to establish and protect the people of Israel. And despite there being no moral, no good Israelite, God is still the one who is ruling over his people and protecting them and providing safety for him, that he upholds his promise even in the face of the people's unfaithfulness. We see this with the story of Gideon that's also in, uh, in that book, right? Gideon has 300 soldiers and goes and has this massive victory. He comes home from that victory and he sets up uh, idols in his hometown. Uh, we see it in the story uh, of Samson who breaks every vow uh, that he's made before God, who sleeps with the enemy of the people uh, and ends up in a spot where he gets, he's used at the very end of his life to provide victory and protection for his, uh, for his people, for the Israelites. The author of the book makes it really clear in the second chapter that the whole book is going to be talk, talking about how God is saving Israel despite their rejecting hit the way to worship him that he's shown them in favor of worshiping other gods or trying to worship Yahweh the way these other gods want to be worshiped. So a story in Judges is not necessarily a model to be followed. We get really used to, especially if we've grown up in the church, doing something like a kids' ministry kind of thing, we get really used to coming to stories in the Bible as if they're all moral lessons for us. As if they're all like the, the tortoise and the hare, where at the end of it we're supposed to see like, oh, this is how I'm supposed to live. I'm supposed to be this way and not this way. But so much of Judges is not there to be moral examples to us. It's to show us God's character and his faithfulness in the face of the unfaithfulness of his people. That he sticks by his word and promise, even if his people don't. And so just because it's in the book of Judges and just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that Jephthah is a model to be followed. If we zoom out and look at the context of the Bible— Jephthah should have known that what he was promising was wrong. A big point of the book of Judges is that right after being like coming into the promised land that already Israel's like, you know what, that law God gave us, not that important. But in that law, in Leviticus 18, it says, do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech, for you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Or in Deuteronomy 12, 31, he says, You must not worship the Lord your God in their way, because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their gods. And so God has already told them, I don't want that. Do not sacrifice your kids. Do not serve me and worship me in the way that these other gods want to be worshipped. That's not who I am. If Jephthah was familiar with who the God was that he was serving, he would have known that that promise would get him the opposite of what he was trying to get. He would have known that you, you don't promise to God human sacrifice in order to get something from him. And then if we zoom out even farther and look at just the cultural context, that human sacrifice was something that Israel's neighbors did all the time including and especially the Ammonites that Jephthah was fighting. And so in this story, Jephthah goes to fight for God and God's people against a group of people who sacrifices their sons and daughters. 
he has victory over them, but then comes back and tragically has to sacrifice his own daughter because of this promise that he's made. And so in summary, Judges 11 is a story of a sinful man from a broken family used by God to protect God's people who goes to war against people who sacrifice children only to return home and sacrifice his own child. It's not a model to follow. It's not a moral example. It's an ironic tragedy of what happens when God's people forget who God is and what it looks like to really and truly follow him. And so there are, there are two principles that I, I want us to take from this passage. The first principle is this, is that it's possible for us to miss God's character. It's possible for us to miss who God is. Jephthah didn't know God's heart. He did not understand who he was serving. He didn't understand whose spirit had come on him. He did not understand who he was living for. And it had tragic ramifications. He thought that Yahweh was just like the other gods around him. And he didn't much care to look into the truth. Right? He's not a man who went and studied God's law, who went to understand who he was fighting for, who his nation served. He was more concerned maybe with protecting his family or their area or becoming head of his family or, or maybe rewriting his own story. And he was treating Yahweh as if it was just any other Canaanite god and offering what he thought that God would want. And he assumed that by offering human life, that God would be one to his side. And we sometimes make the same mistake. Not human sacrifice, hopefully. Um, but we a lot of times make the same mistake where we think we know who God is. We think we know what he wants from us but we've misjudged his character and we think that, that we have a better idea of what he wants than maybe even what his word would show us. Or if we were to dig into his word to get to know him better, we would realize that we had a misconception about what he wants. Right, like uh, as an example, it's like really common for us to, to think, oh, okay, man, God is such a, he's such a loving God. God is so, man, he just, it's just, I bet he just wants me to be so happy. He's just so, like, on my side. And he's, whatever makes me happy, I'm pretty sure that's what God wants. If it's a happy thing, it's a God thing. Uh, if, I, if my heart is moved towards it, then it must be him. If my emotions are peaked, that must be the spirit leading me. And we have these, these ideas where we're like, you know what? And we just run towards things that maybe he's clearly marked out for us. We're like, you know what? Like, I just... God wants me to be happy. I just want to be happy. We're just going to sleep together before we're married. Like, what, what's the big deal? Right? God, God's on my side. And what we've missed is that, of course, God wants what's best for us. But that what is best for us might be something that we're missing. Right? We've missed maybe that, that God is a God who is incredibly faithful and has designed us to be faithful also. And he's assigned aspects of our life to happen within a faithful commitment within marriage, not to just be thrown around before those promises are made. And so we've misunderstood a little bit of who he is. We've misunderstood a little bit of his calling on our life. And we decide, you know what, I'm just going to do this because I'm pretty sure God won't have any problem with it. Or other times, our idea of God is almost completely opposite. We're like, man, like God's he, he just wants to burden me. God just always has all these, he always has heavy things for me to do. God just loves to bring painful sacrifice into my life, to twist my arm, to, to really test me. And we have this idea that God wants to put a heavy something on our shoulders. And so when he starts moving in us, and giving us an idea of maybe how he wants to move in our life or a conversation he wants to draw us into or a person that he wants us to connect with or a, maybe a career change that he wants us to consider or a, a move of schools or whatever it is. And we can sense maybe it's a little bit of him drawing us to that. 
because we're worried that he just wants to take things from us or just wants to test us or just wants to put our feet to the fire, instead of running towards his plan with joy, we run away from it because we've misunderstood who he is. He's a God who's designed us with a very specific calling. The Bible says that, that he's brought you to him not by works, that it's all by grace, but he's done it because he has works that he's planned from the beginning of time for you to do. That he wants you to join in with his work. He wants you to be a part of what he's doing in this world. The Bible says, Jesus says that, that his burden, his yoke is, is light because he's the one who carries it for us. He's already done all of the things necessary for us to be connected with God. He wants us to be able to to run with him passionately. But when we're concerned that maybe God is more of an overbearing father than someone who wants to, to bless us as we obey, then we tend to run away from what he wants instead of run towards it. When we think that he's more of like a happy-go-lucky grandpa who just wants to smile at us no matter what we do, then we just choose to do all sorts of things that run counter to how he's designed us and the best that he has planned for us. When we don't understand who God is, is we're way more prone to make mistakes that are completely avoidable, to making choices that he would want to point us away from. And so it's so important for us to really know who it is that we serve, that we worship, that we live our life for. It's more than just a name. It's more than just an idea. He's a person with a full-fledged character that we get to reflect in our life. And so how do we avoid those mistakes? Uh, one important piece of it is by searching through Scripture ourselves. Right? That, that God's Word wants to point us to who He is. The more we understand His Word, the more we're going to understand the, the one who's given that Word, the one who has spoken through it and wants to speak into our lives. And so we want to dig into that. And when we come to weird passages or passages that seem to go counter to what we would think has already been shown, like in God's word, then we want to dig into that and understand that better instead of just do what I had done, which was just kind of be like, oh, I don't understand and just keep moving. We want to understand who Jesus is and what he came to do for us. When we find ourselves challenged because maybe God is calling us to obedience and we're, we're concerned that he doesn't have our best interest in mind, instead of running from that, we should run to understand, okay, God, who, would you remind me again who you are? We also want to walk in community. We want to be people who have godly friends around us who are going to point us to what is good, who are going to uh, point us back to Jesus to remind us of his love for us and his sacrifice for us. When we're tempted to stray away from that, who can call us back into relationship with God. We also want to be people who find wise counsel. And when we're weighing those really difficult choices in life and we're trying to understand what's best in our life, we want to know who are the people who are one or two life stages ahead of me who I can go to and, and ask for advice, who I'm really going to listen to, that I'm going to ask them to speak into my life and then I'm not going to like only want to hear what I want to hear. Who are the people that I would trust to maybe tell me the exact opposite of what I want to hear, but I, I know that they have my best in mind and they also are someone who is walking closely with God, whether it's a life group leader or a mentor or someone who we've looked up to in the past. And so that's kind of the, the first thing that comes out of this story is that Jephthah absolutely could have avoided that mistake if he knew who God was. And there are going to be things for us in our life that we could avoid, traps that we can avoid falling into if we have a better idea of who God is. And the second thing is, the second kind of principle that comes out of this that I think is important for us to see is that we don't need to barter with God to be blessed by God. That we don't need to bargain with him. We don't need to offer him like, hey God, if you do this for me, then I'll do this for you. Or, hey, God, you know, and if you could take care of this thing over here, then I'll maybe clean up this mess in my life. And we don't need to play that game with God. The enemies of ancient Israel all served gods that worked that way. Gods who were fertility gods over crops or birth 
or were rain gods or gods of the ocean. They all, they all served these gods that they would make these sacrifices to, and they would just cross their fingers and hope that things worked out. And the story of our God is a God who moves towards us, whether it's Israel and him finding them and bringing them out of slavery, or more importantly for you or you and I, God coming in the flesh and taking care of our sin problem on the cross so that we can have a relationship with him. He did all of that for us when we could offer him nothing and before we even thought about moving towards him. And so I don't know where you're at in your relationship with God or what it is that you're feeling like maybe, like, all right, God, like, if you can take care of this, then I'll take care of this. I don't know where it is that you want him to move or maybe an area where he's not moving and you're trying to figure out, God, what is it that you're waiting for me to fix up? What do I need to show you? What do I need to earn for you in order for you to help and come and fix this thing? But I want to offer you an encouragement as the, as the band comes up and we get ready to go into our last song, this encouragement from Romans chapter 8 where it says for us that, that God did not keep his own son for himself but gave him for us all. Then with his son, will he not give us all things? That God didn't hold back Jesus from us. He gave us what was most important to him so that we could be returned to him. And if he wouldn't keep that from you, there's nothing else that he's keeping from you, waiting for you to be good enough in order to bring it. There's no good thing that he's just keeping from you because he doesn't want to give it to you. That he's already shown his heart for us. That he wants to love us and he wants to bless us before we even move towards him. We don't need to be people who bargain with him, who try to play a game with him, who have to figure out, okay, what is the weird thing that he's trying to get me to do? What is the one thing that he wants? That instead, we are people who have been brought into a relationship with him, who have been loved by him, who are always loved by him, and we get the joy of growing to be his people. That we get the, the joy of learning what it looks like to obey and to love him well. That he's not waiting for you to be good enough to give you his love, that he's already loved you. And now out of that response, we get to choose to love him back. Not as an exchange. Not as a bargaining chip. But because he's already chosen to love us. We don't need to offer sacrifices. He's already offered that on our behalf. Would you guys stand with me as we go into this last song? Jesus, thank you for your amazing love that you've given us. Thank you for your sacrifice. And God, thank you for your word. Thank you that even in sometimes the, the weird stories and the strange stories that hidden in there, there's a, a little glimmer of who you are. That you're someone who chooses to bless us before we offer our weird idea of how we think that you want to work. God, that you're someone who, who loves us and takes care of us even in the midst of our imperfections. That you're a God who is faithful even when we're not. And God, I pray that more and more we would be committed to knowing you deeper. That we would dive into your word and there we would discover a God who loves us and cares about us and has an amazing plan for his creation and has chosen to use us as a part of that plan. God, I pray that as we know you better, God, that you would keep us from falling into those pitfalls of serving you in ways that we're not designed to. God, would you bless us this week with a deeper understanding of who you are? In Jesus' name, amen.